Welcome. Welcome to the Ohio State University Latinx Experience Staff Edition presentation, the second webinar in our three-part event series that discovers, unpacks, and discusses the lived experience for three different populations at Ohio State, student, staff, and faculty. Thank you to our panelists, attendees, and future viewers for joining us tonight. Please allow me to introduce myself. I am Michael Bustamante, he, him, his pronouns, and I'm the Latinx Student Success Program Coordinator within the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. The Latinx Student Success Team works to cultivate Latinx communities for academic, social, and professional support. The LSS team promotes full inclusion of Latinx students and seeks to raise the visibility of Latinx groups on campus. Through high impact programs and collaborations, the LSS team is here to serve students, staff, and faculty of the Ohio State Latinx community. This goal is met with three signature programs, the Mesa Early Arrival Program, the Mesa Leadership Institute, and the Conversaciones con Café event series. More information about LSS can be found at the ODI website, odi.osu.edu. Now, before we're jumping into our question and answer panelist presentation, I would like to note that ODI is celebrating its 50th anniversary. As the university celebrates its sesquicentennial, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion has a special anniversary of our own to recognize, our 50th birthday. From our tumultuous beginnings in 1970 until today, our office has stood proudly as a fierce advocate for historically underrepresented students, staff, and faculty. The world has changed over the past half century, but we have never wavered from our bedrock belief that greater inclusion has merit and diversity brings us strength. It is important to us to honor the giants of diversity whose shoulders we stand on today. That is why in early 2021, we will induct the first 50 icons of inclusion into our inaugural Office of Diversity and Inclusion Hall of Fame. As we turn 50, we vow that our best days are ahead of us. We have ambitious plans to expand our capacities by tirelessly building onto the foundation of our, our first half century, removing barriers every day. We all benefit when diversity and inclusion is woven through our daily work. And to succeed, we must all pull together. We look forward to your continued commitment as we push onward for the next horizon. Now, a few comments before I introduce our panelists for today. We are offering closed captioning for this event, so please feel free to use that function below. Also, our final webinar for faculty held tomorrow is still open for registration, so please feel free to register for that event as well, odi.osu.edu. And finally, throughout the presentation tonight, feel free to ask questions using the Q&A function below as well. Now, all of that said, please allow me to introduce our panelists for tonight. Ferdinand Avila Medina, a native from Puerto Rico, is an education professional with nearly three decades of experience in higher education administration, retention and development of college students, instructional design, e-learning, corporate communications, learning and motivation, and adult learning. He currently works as a learning specialist at Ohio State in Newark where he also teaches learning and motivation strategies for college success. Ferdinand is a current member of the University Staff Advisory Committee and serves as chair of the Inclusive Excellence Subcommittee. Also joining us, Daniel Rodriguez, a proud 2017 alumnus of The Ohio State University, graduating summa cum laude with honors from the College of Arts and Sciences with a degree in communication and a minor in theater. He currently serves the university as the program coordinator for parent and family relations, where he provides support in the day-to-day -day implementation of fundraising campaigns and the management of donor databases. Presently, Daniel is also pursuing a master of public administration degree in the John Glenn College of Public Affairs, with hopes of one day building and implementing more inclusive retention practices for college students, faculty, and staff. Finally, Daniel is a published author. His first book, The Peregrine Muse, is currently on sale nationwide. Last but not least, Leticia Wiggins. She is constantly looking for innovative ways to engage the public in conversations on the connections between race, gender, and class. As a historian who has made her way into public media, she's excited for the potential to explore these connections through accessible and innovative platforms. 
Welcome to our panelists. Now for our question and answer portion. Once again, friendly reminder, you may ask questions using the Q&A function below. Our first question, how would you self-describe your Latinx identity? Should I go first? <clears throat> hey, well, uh, good night everyone, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to be here. That's a complex question and I'm gonna answer in a complex way. So my Latinx identity, and by the way, if anybody watched the uh, Momento Latino last Monday and you saw the skit between George Lopez and uh, Rita Moreno debating whether we should use the Latinx or why we should use the Latinx, go check it out on YouTube because personally, I'm an old school, I have a hard time. So if I do not say Latinx, don't hold it against me, it's just force of habit, okay? But try to be inclusive. So that's part of the complexity of the identity, right? There's a lot of uh, intersectionality in being uh, Latino. Uh, it's complex because of the, the system that we live in. Uh, just to give you a very short example, um, I'm a mixed race. My, my mom is white, my dad is black, uh, but of course, we always identify as Puerto Rican, right? Because we don't have, actually up until very, very little time ago, uh, we couldn't even identify race if you were Puerto Rican. You only could choose in, in federal forms and state forms uh, your place of origin and not your uh, identity in terms of uh, race, which is just only one uh, element. So for me, it was not until very recently that I was able to find a federal form that allowed me to actually say, hey, I'm mixed race, I'm Puerto Rican, yes, but that's not a race, it's just a place of origin. So um, it's, it's a complex issue, uh, but I'm sure that we will hear more about that from others as well. I'll piggyback off that. <laughs> That was awesome, Fernand. I'm thinking about my mom too. And she's like, what is this X? What is Latinx? And so <laughs> but I think that that's like a really interesting point. Um, and I, I guess speaking of my own identity, I like to ask other people that question a lot in the work I've done, but I don't like to answer it as much. It's really kind of complicated. Um, but I'm also from, let's see, I guess in a way like a mixed background, my mom's Mexican and my dad is white. Um, and kind of growing up, you know, I'm one of five and I think we all sort of present our identities in different ways phenotypically, right? So you could look at any one of us and my brother could, you know, I think he was maybe perceived as more Mexican and I'm perceived as more white. So there's always been this interesting passing that's happened, um, even though culturally very much always embraced being Mexican. And then coming to the Midwest, I think, and living here from California has really changed the way that I identify um, in a way that's very interesting and sort of made me really embrace that a lot. So I don't know if, if others feel that way. And I know like some of us from or, or some are from here, um, but coming to here, it, it, it relationally everything feels really different. So I think that in, in thinking about my identity, I say I'm Latina. Whereas I know my sister who I love and is awesome and is watching, um, but she kind of did her studies in New Mexico. And she's like, I'm Chicana, like I'm a proud Chicana. And I'm like, oh, that's so, interesting sister why are you chicana but i'm latina like so it's like this really complicated thing that i think i'm negotiating but in finding friends here and in finding kind of a latino community i found a lot of puerto rican friends and colombian friends and it's not kind of one sort of chicana mexican identity so there's my really long-winded answer but it's constantly changing it's really complicated and it's kind of fun to answer that and actually think critically about it i think it's always fascinating uh, when we talk about identity as Latinos and Latinas, because it's no one blanket and, and one, so Latino excludes one, Hispano excludes another. And, and at the end of the day, it's, it's really, I mean, it comes down to context. And so it's how, first of all, what the environment in which you exist, as well as the way that, that you want to be addressed, because at the end of the day, the most inclusive thing we can do is ask, how should I address you? Or, or what are your pronouns and things of that nature? And so when you think about identity, I know if I if I told my abuela who's Cubana, I was like, you're Latinx. And she's like, no, I'm a proud Cubana. I, I came here. I'm a Cubana. I lived in Miami. I, I did all these things. And my dad is also Cubano. My mom is Mexicana. Um, and so it's it's never been Latino. It's what are you? It's oh, you're you're Mexican, you're Cuban, and but but you don't sound Mexican or Cuban when you talk because you don't have an accent, or when you're speaking Spanish, it doesn't sound like Mexican Spanish, and it doesn't sound like Cuban Spanish, and it doesn't sound like 
like Castilian Spanish from Spain. So, so where do you fit? And, and, and that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's at the end of the day, that's it. That's you were a melting pot of, of our origin stories. And we, we represent this tapestry of threads from these different countries and these different stories. And at the end of the day, it's, it comes down to my Latino identity is very different than my, the identity of my brothers, my two younger brothers. They, they look at it in a different way as well. And, and of my parents and of my grandparents. And it's, it's so much about where we are in time and what's, what's important to us. And uh, to Leticia's point, when I came to Ohio State, I came from a very homogenous, conservative, uh, I was the only uh, person of color in my high school and my school system until my brothers joined me in high school and, and there were two of us. So it's, it's this whole idea of coming to Ohio State then, where it was a much more diverse, uh, let's say comparatively to where I came from, but still not that much at all. And so it, 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 you find your people and you find your community and you embrace who you are and what brings you together with other people that much more. And I think the beauty of, of, of our culture, whatever that means to, to each of us, is that it's, it's really rooted in, in tradition and connection and, 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 and finding that community. Amazing, amazing responses. I appreciate this this contextualization of identity. And I, as we saw here, we have Leticia from California, uh, Daniel here from the state of Ohio, and Fernand from Puerto Rico. It's this contextualization that's really, really important. Uh, moving on to our next question. So in your opinion, kind of uh, um, adding this Latinx identity and Ohio State, what is the most prevalent issue affecting the Latinx Buckeye community? I guess if, if I can take that one, um, or at least kick it off uh, for me. So I'm, I'm pursuing my master's of public administration here at the university. I also, I, I pursue my undergraduate degree here at Ohio State. I think when I was a first year student about 2027 years ago now, it was, I believe about 2.2, 2.4% of the, you know, the whole university system population was Latino student population was Latino. Uh, by the time, I, don't, I think at this point now, we're about a 4.5%, so it's doubled, which is a, a very statistically significant increase. But still you look at the numbers and it's, we're still a minority. I think the biggest issue for us, what I recognized, at least through my research and my, in my educational programs and just in my conversations with colleagues and, and friends, it's not so much getting Latinos here, it's more so the support systems once they are here. So when I look at retention policies for, for Latinos, I mean, it, for students or for faculty, for staff, it's all about the sense of, of belonging and community and that sense of, of, I'm a part of something bigger than myself. So in, in different programs that I've gotten involved with, it's always about shrinking the, the behemoth that is the Ohio State community into a more digestible, um, piece that, that feels true to me and true to, to my friends and, and where I can resonate with other people's identities because it is such a large overwhelming space. And when I hear about colleagues in other departments that are also Latino, Latina, there just aren't a lot of us here. And so I look in at, I work in advancement specifically here, the foundation for the university. I mean, I wanna say there are less than 10 of us in an enterprise of about 500 employees. I'm the only one in my building, so it's, it's kind of isolating and you got to really be active in seeking out other people that again to the intersectionality piece that it might not be Latinos but it might be people of color and it might be people that at least have a fragment of the understanding of you know we just kind of feel alone and, and it doesn't have to be that way because we are here and it's a matter of, of you know offices like ODI it's um, organizations like I, I participate with OLE, the organization of Latinx Hispanic employees at the university. It's, it's finding and actively seeking out those communities because that is something that's important to me. I, I plan to be at the university for some time and I'd, and I'd like to know that there are other people like me here and I know they're here. And so it's finding those ways to bring us together, especially now when we're so far apart. Following up on that, <clears throat> uh idea uh, that Daniel is uh, exposing about the lack of participation and representation uh, that brings a, a bigger problem both for students, staff and faculty, which is the lack of role models, right? Because 
where are we? Um, I was at a meeting this morning. We were sharing uh, some interesting statistics about uh, economic segregation uh, in the United States. And Columbus happened to be one of the top uh, economic segregated cities uh, in the United States. So it happens that uh, when you see Latinos, you wonder, where are we? Uh, what role do we play in leadership positions at the university when you see at uh, uh, executive teams at the university at multiple levels, do you see a role model that you can actually show a student? And it's not only limited, of course, to diversity and inclusion officer, which are great, by the way, uh, let's keep bringing more. But uh, where are we in terms of leadership position to serve as role model for this generation that we're trying to uh, develop? And if you think that on the Columbus campus is an issue, go to the extended campuses where I work. Uh, the representation of minorities is, uh, at least on staff, uh, it's not there. Uh, luckily, in students, at least the campus where I work, the, the uh, uh, minority participation in student population is amazing. So we do have an extremely diverse, but again, we have more diverse students, but we have fewer role models for those students that can actually mentor and, and, and help those students develop uh, beyond just simply the academic. As somebody who's been a student at OSU, let's see, for like nine years, <laughs> I went to undergrad and grad school there. Um, I just feel so much of what Daniel and Ferdinand are also saying. So, you know, I, I just completely agree with that. I guess to tack on something I've been thinking a lot about lately in terms of a unique challenge that I'm facing, and I know many of us do, is this sort of idea of representation and how we're supposed to represent um, Latino data as one person. And that's something that I think speaks to issues of representation amongst even staff, like how many people are, you know, in my organization, I am the one Latina. Um, and, you know, I don't think people in the hallway necessarily know when they walk by me that that's the, the case, you know, but those who do sometimes, and by no fault of theirs, you know, rely heavily on asking me, well, what do you think about this certain thing if we feature this Mexican artist? Or what do you think about this? And I think that that's a challenge students face in the classroom as well it's a it's kind of it's not a bad burden um but i i think that it's an interesting conundrum that we all are facing when we're trying to represent a really complex identity and culture and difference and sort of i feel that weighing on me a lot lately in terms of just being the sole person who is supposedly an expert on that you know and so that's something else i just want to add this is great. Uh, this this sense of belonging, this um, this needing of building a community, uh, the lack of rep rep representation of Latinx role models, and we actually have an audience question that really fits in nicely with with what we're discussing. So Daniel spoke about fit and community. How in a majority white environment such as Columbus and Ohio State, do you work to find a network of Latinx people in OSU and Columbus? And I'll just open that up. I, we have a, a very robust um, vehicle in the university that we can use as a, you know, like, let's say that's the impetus for finding people around the community, because the university is connected to everything and everybody in the city. It's the economic workhorse. It's also a producer of, of new talent for industry in the, in the city. Um, so I, I started inward and looked outward um, as an employee. So as I mentioned previously, um, the organization of Latinx Hispanic employees at the university has been an incredibly rewarding experience for me. I've been able to meet people from all levels at the university. And for me, the intersectionality piece comes in immediately because, I mean, most of the teams I work with in my, in my work, my day job, let's call it, and the organizations that I associate my with, myself with, you know, beyond those responsibilities, the intersectionality of age is also very relevant to me. I'm the youngest person often by five plus years. And so I bring in a different perspective. And a lot of times advancement is 80% uh, women, mostly white women. So as a brown man, it's a very different environment. Not very different than what I've been used to throughout, you know, 25 years of living in Ohio. But it's still, you know, it's one of those things where you have to work a little bit harder. So uh, organization of Latinx uh, Hispanic employees the Latinx Alumni Society through the Alumni Association. So I had the wonderful uh, fortune of attending the university. 
And as an alum, I think you have so many opportunities. And even if you're not, it's a community that's growing. So I serve on the board of that organization, trying to recruit members in the community to, I mean, as, as Ferdinand mentioned, this idea of mentorship is so important. It's critical to making people recognize that there are role models that, that look like you and, and have been successful in industry and that have kind of made it a little bit easier for you to be able to do the same. And so listening to those narratives from alumni has been incredibly rewarding. Looking beyond the university community, I look to organizations like the Ohio Commission on Hispanic Latino Affairs or OSHLAM, a fantastic resource statewide in terms of, you know, we're talking about aggregating COVID resources or voting resources or census resources or research, just about anything in the policy sphere that's happening at the, at the statewide level. It's great to then get connected with all the organizations that that agency touches. So that's been a wonderful resource. Um, and then it, it, it's just a matter of, you know, being passionate about the identity piece, because it is taxing, you know, the 4.4 percentage, or you look around, you're the only one, and that's a, that's a classic narrative. But knowing that there are people that really care about it in the community, and, and, and the, I think Columbus is fantastic in the human service chamber, and just in the nonprofit sphere, in terms of providing opportunities for people of color to, to be empowered and to, for people that have that privilege to then make the space for people that don't have that privilege, those who have been marginalized, to have a platform to make change and to connect with people that, that look like that. And so that connection piece, it, it's certainly there. And it, it takes a little bit of digging, but uh, I've certainly been able to find that in, in my search. I'm not going to expand too much because Daniel did an amazing job covering that. Um, <clears throat> personally, I work with the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, which is uh, the oldest Hispanic advocacy organization uh, in the United States. And actually, we do have a very strong chapter here uh, in Ohio. You can check it out, lulacohio.org. Um, we do a lot of work with uh, 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 fundraising for a uh, scholarship for Hispanic Latino students in the uh, Columbus area and the uh, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Dayton area as well. Uh, we work with the immigration issues. We recently were working with uh, uh, detention facilities here in Ohio uh, and how immigrants are being uh, uh, treated in those uh, state-run uh, facilities. Uh, so it, it, you need to reach out uh, as well and, and do as much as you can uh, also because uh, I mean, uh, we have multiple responsibilities uh, at, at work, family, but don't think because you can do too much uh, and you cannot connect with everybody, it's not worth it. Uh, look for any organization that you can actually join, uh, even if it looks small, sometimes the smaller, the better. I love the kind of following your interests to do to find find your people and find your group. I think that was something that it took, it's taken me a long time to sort of find a place and I'm constantly sort of shifting there. But coming to OSU, I have to shout out to Que Pasa and Yolanda Cepeda because that was kind of an amazing thing to see a magazine, um, like a physical copy of that, like maybe it's still physical, but where you see people and you hear their experiences and getting involved with that was sort of a way that felt like, okay, like we are highlighting the folks that are here and this is like true in our community, right? And so sort of the way that I got more involved with, um, with I guess the Latino community was through Que Pasa and sort of doing a little reporting and starting to tell stories. And that bug sort of followed me through undergrad to grad school. Um, and then once I was done with grad school, when I went to start at WOSU, I feel like that's when I actually started to reach out into the community outside of Ohio State and realized that oh, like Columbus is huge, right? And there's like, there are Latinos all over on the north side, west side, east side, and actually driving and physically going over to like the Westland Mall area um, or up north to, you know, various like um, barber shops and taquerias. Like there's a lot of different things going on. And I think that's just expanded my circle and just knowing of people and working, um, with WOSU sort of did this project called Dimelo Columbus, which just sort of investigated what identity means to, to everybody and where everybody was from. And it just kind of took pockets from throughout our community of entrepreneurs, um, students, you name it. And we just sort of spoke on that. So that, that sort of in, increased my community and some of them are my really good friends now of the folks that I just kind of blindly asked for an interview. 
Um, so that was really from my own interest in sort of investigating my own identity, very selfish, but this really expanded my community in that way as well. Wonderful, wonderful. So a lot of these answers are about what we as employees can do. So this next question is about the university. What can the university do to support you as a Latinx staff member? Hire more. Get us fired. Sorry. Go ahead, Leticia. No, I was going to say hire more Latinos. <laughs> Sorry, I'm done. For none, please go. No, I was just telling you that we're going to get fired. No, no listen, uh, I'm going to start by, with the premise that I have had a great experience here at Ohio State. Uh, I've been here 12 years and I've been looking for any job since then because uh, um, there are a lot of areas in which we can improve, uh, but I have been in many places that are uh, significantly more things to develop. But what kind of things we uh, can do? Uh, certainly be more proactive uh, in hiring uh, a more diverse workforce, particularly at the higher administrative level, uh, but also uh, helping the, the ones that are here getting promoted from within. Um, I can tell you, 12 years, I've not been looking for a job, but nobody has ever come to me uh, asking if I'm interested in another kind of position at Ohio State. So this idea of growing from within and, and, and developing the talent that we currently have, there's a lot of work to be done uh, at Ohio State. And, and it's being done, by the way. Uh, I work at the University Staff Advisory Committee and I, I do know the, the big effort that HR is doing, the leadership, uh, uh, the new president, but we, we're just uh, at the initial state, a uh, very incipient uh, movement just to get uh, where we need to be in terms of diversity, in terms of helping our own talent being uh, developed. So we need more funding for professional uh, development. So uh, probably enhancing the, the amount of money that we put into professional development, particularly in leadership, not just general professional development, but leadership development in the staff that we have is essential if we want to have, again, those role models that we need and that representation that is hardly needed in, in our university. I agree. I think that's an amazing response uh, that these and Ferdinand, um, developing of staff, promotions, hiring more Latinx individuals to create those Latinx role models that we alluded to earlier in the conversation. Uh, that said, we're all doing and navigating COVID-19 as best we can. Um, it's impacting students, it's impacting staff and faculty. Classes are now online, meetings are being held on Zoom as we are now. And so I have a question for all of you in attendance. How has your role changed during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, I guess speaking from somebody who's used to being out in the field and like what I do is kind of a, a myriad task at WSU. I get to do some fun interviewing and chatting with folks, recording voices and filming sometimes. Um, and that's been a really unique thing to sort of do a lot more of this Zoom um, call format. So that's like a very, uh, logistical sort of difference. But something else that's been really interesting as of late, and I'm kind of curious to hear if other panel members are feeling this as well, is with all of the social unrest, the very like um, legitimate social unrest that's happening right now, I think that identity is becoming more of a thing that's at the forefront of a lot of my coworkers' minds um, and also higher ups minds. And in thinking about equity and inclusion and diversity, there's a whole bunch of conversations surrounding that. So I know that our, like WOSU's created a diversity board, which I am a part of, um, you know, volunteered for. And it's a lot of people who are the diverse ones at, you know, and not, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, but often, you know, we're the ones doing the work to sort of try to make this change. So what's changed, what's different now, and I don't know if it's even just COVID or all of the things that are happening in addition to that, but I think there's a new sort of lens that's focusing on this and there's a kind of a responsibility that I feel that I don't know I'm not saying like I'm the best person to do it but at least by caring about it that's something um so that's been really interesting and sort of stressful <laughs> um but really promising at the same time so I'm kind of curious if others feel that way as well yeah I would completely agree with that I think for better or for worse and I want to be optimistic but I also want to be realistic that had we not been in this environment and had the events that transpired over May, June, and unfortunately continue to transpire in terms of the racial unrest in this country, 
I don't know if we would have been as open to or as accessible to as many people to engage in the conversation because often the excuse and Leticia alluded to it, diversity inclusion equity work often becomes an echo chamber. And so it's, you know, it's the choir preaching again that this is an issue and this is an issue, but it's, you know, sometimes the choir needs a tune up. We got to get the people that are not typically involved in singing the song and get them involved because it does not change without collaboration. What has opened my eyes, at least in advancement. So I serve on the Advancement Inclusion Council as the vice president. And what we've tried to do is open up forums to have conversations about race. Straight up, we called it conversations on racism. And these took place in June. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Advancement's about 500 employees almost 285 people showed up to these conversations. That was shocking to me. And, and you look across, and as Fernand alluded, you know, there's not that much representation in leadership, and there really isn't uh, across the university, and that's true in advancement, but they were present. So I think presence and being in that moment and giving of yourself and your time and your interest I think has been huge. It's opened the door to allyship in a way that I had not seen previously. There's a lot of allyship fatigue, I will say, from our community as well, because it's it's been intensified the amount of time and the amount of energy that it takes to talk about this, because so many people are curious and interested and want to learn more, and that's fantastic. But it's 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 a lot. It's a lot to carry that onus and, and to be, you know, an authoritative figure on I know what this is like because I live this, but I also have to show other people because they don't. And it's at the end of the day, that's a very positive thing to have that interest in what's affecting the community at large. So I, I am optimistic with what I've seen and the, the conversations that have been held and the, the willingness of people to, to show up to the table, um, often because People like us have often been excluded from the table or when we do show up to the table, it's, it's just a folding chair. It's not really a full chair either. So it's nice to, to be able to welcome people to a different table and, and let them know that, you know, it's kind of the narrative is flipped because we come often into situations at a deficit and we've either been, you know, withheld opportunities through systemic issues or from our upbringing or just the general sense of not being aware of the way the society works within the corporate sphere. And here it's flipped because we are the experts in what this looks like. Our, our black and brown um, counterparts are this. This is it's unavoidable. It's it's what we live every day. And so if we can do something to educate, and COVID has opened the door for better or for worse in a digital setting, then it instantly becomes that much more accessible to people. Because I could be living in California right now and attend this meeting where I couldn't do that six months ago, maybe eight months ago. If I may add one final word to that, the COVID has uh, uh, brought a lot of uh, emotional upheaval. Uh, I, I call it the roller coaster effect, but has also allowed us to learn a lot about this identity, the identity that we were talking from at the beginning. Um, in my uh, particular perspective, I have learned a lot to, to kind of observe and, and try to learn from the perspective of the others. I told you I, I have a mixed uh, racial background, my mom being white and uh, my dad being black, uh, but my skin is white. <clears throat> so if I don't open my mouth, uh, nobody's gonna know that I'm Latino. Of course, my accent is gonna give me up any time, but I know that even though I have suffered some kind of a, a, a race, racial experiences uh, in my life, it's not the same experience that the black community or the, the, my brother, who happens to be the, the darker skin uh, in the family. So for me, uh, I have had to sometimes to just simply learn to step back and learn from the experience of the others because it has not been the same as mine. And sometimes, particularly in this uh, uh, racially intense uh, uh, experience that we're having right now, uh, we experience some of that, but we also need to learn that others are experiencing a totally different environment than we are, and we need to respect that space as well. And we, 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 we need to bring solidarity, we need to bring uh, uh, our efforts together, uh, but we also need to, to understand that their experience is different. And I see that in my classroom when I'm dealing with uh, black students that I know that what they're feeling right now it's a lot different than that other students are. So for me, I, I have learned and grown 
from this process as well. So these are really some, some, some emotionally charged descriptions, um, allyship fatigue, emotional upheaval. And so from the global pandemic and, and the Black Lives Matter civil rights movement and to the upcoming election, there's a lot that's going on in 2020 and to Americans everywhere. So what activity has helped you remain calm during these unprecedented times? And have you picked up a new activity? I don't have an activity, but I have a tool. I grab my guitar. I'm gonna leave it there because this is not about to be a concert. I just have a guitar always next to me. <laughs> when I'm stressed out, I just grab the guitar and put the radio, some salsa music, start playing. Sometimes I have some drums on the basement where nobody's uh, bothered. Um, luckily, I'm most of the time alone in my house, so nobody's gonna be bothered if I'm making a lot of noise. So far, the neighbors have not complained. I just have to jump in. That was amazing, amazing. <laughs> I'm gonna say Ferdinand's guitar is giving me a lot of peace right now. <laughs> he should play some more. <laughs> no, I was gonna say is we've been doing a lot of nature stuff. So camping, hiking, kind of being outside has actually been a really amazing kind of boon during these times. Yeah, outside is incredibly recharging. Um, good music and uh, spending time with family. I mean, it's so my brother started a program in, in Florida. And so he moved away in the middle of the pandemic. My other brother is now starting college as well. And so it's, everyone's kind of moving apart. And for the months of, let's say, March through July, we were traveling, quarantining, of course, and taking the necessary precautions between our, our stays in different places. But being able to spend time with family that I have not spent that amount of time at home since I was a high school senior. And being in that amount of time with my brothers and with my parents and with my grandparents has been really, I mean, unforgettable. Probably will never happen again. So just being incredibly grateful that amidst everything that's happening and everything that might be wrong with the world, um, those little sparks of joy that came from being able to spend that time with family and, and really feeling that, that togetherness and that connectedness has been really special. I just want to shout out, hey, Adrian. Um, so moving on, uh, I like to travel. And that's one of the ways that I kind of remain calm during these times. And with all that's going on, we can travel. And so in lieu of traveling, I'm a huge foodie. And I've been trying new restaurants and new places, uh, new cultural spots here in Columbus. And so for the panelists, what is your favorite Latinx restaurant in Columbus or Newark? I just went to the Taco Authority out in Westland area and they had amazing, it was it was delicious. It was amazing. They had pumpkin flour, um, empanada kind of things, which were delicious. Um, so I think that's kind of tied right now with Alabrijes and then I love Juniors and then I love Los Gauchos. So really, I think it's just the taco, I have a soft spot for all tacos. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely Los Guachos for me. Um, on Monday, buy one, get one al pastor, I and mean, you can't beat that. So that's top notch. Well, I live in Zanesville, so not many options there, but over here we have a tlaquepaque, good uh, Mexican food. But when I'm in the Columbus area, I go to Taste Bay. They're not paying me for the advertisement, but you ask. Uh, they make the best Puerto Rican mofongo that you could actually eat. So if you want uh, a good mofongo with Puerto Rican flavor, Face Bay is a place to go. Oh my gosh, Talake Pake in Cambridge, or is it Cambridge or Caldwell? I've been there and I've been to the Zanesville one too, but it's so funny for Anand, I've never heard anyone mention that before. Uh, so next question, <clears throat> what are your tips for students who are starting their post-college job search during a pandemic? That's a tough one. I'm going to try to give it a, a good shot. So students who are looking for employment after the pandemic, uh, start building that resume as strongly as possible. Okay, uh, Connect with the Office of Career Services to help you actually do a professional resume. A lot of our students don't take advantage of those uh, resources, so they should 
uh, as much as they can, uh, but also start thinking and reflecting how the COVID events have shaped them and helped them learn uh, to adjust and adapt to new situations. Sometimes you might think that, oh, nobody's going to care about that, but it is significant when you can actually explain to a future employer uh, what kind of strategies you use uh, to overcome the barriers and the challenges brought by COVID. Uh, that growth and learning opportunity goes beyond what you just learned uh, in the classroom. So uh, for students who are building that resume and they don't have too much uh, experience, that would be the case. And if they still have a chance, they're not that many, uh, they could still try to apply for an internship, even if it's an online uh, internship that will help them hone those uh, skills that employers are looking. I think that the narrative of, of resiliency is really important to capitalize right now because as, as Fernand said, like maybe it's not visible on your resume, but what you've gone through to get that degree or to finish that course or to just to get up in the morning and feel energized to do anything at all, I think is incredibly powerful. Additionally, as we were alluding to earlier, I think COVID has really lowered some barriers in a lot of spaces where conversations that might have previously been off limits are kind of getting warmed up to. So if we bring in this idea of bringing your whole self to work, bringing your full identity, it's difficult to do your best work unless you're not fully there. And so when you're in an interview, it's, it's important for students, I think, to recognize that you're interviewing them as much as they are interviewing you. How much do you see yourself in that company? And if there's not a place for you, do you feel that you can that you can kind of that you can make that space for yourself or that you can get advocates that will help you craft that path within the company or within wherever you are? And I think it's important at the university is how do we build these pathways as well to really see yourself going somewhere, to see yourself in leadership 10, 15 years down the line? Because if you don't see that opportunity at a company, it's difficult to even feel the, the need or the urge to apply in the first place. So yeah, I mean, recognize that you hold a lot of power when you're starting out, but being humble and, and uh, you know, leaning back on what you've learned and, and the interactions you've had to have while you were a student here. And I think that's incredibly important. Just going to second, the resume services, use them. I wish I had. Um, that's something that, you know, will give you a bit of an edge. Also, I'd say try to keep um, those professional references or your professional kind of mentors close as you're like endeavoring to do your next next step and just make sure to keep in touch because I feel like down the line, you never know when you're gonna need those references and just kind of giving them a sense of where you're, what you're thinking, where you're going, also can pr provide some sort of networks for you. So I feel like a lot of the opportunities I sort of discovered were through a lot of professional mentors, which I'm like still so grateful for. Um, and then the other thing, this is sort of like, it's also just be kind to yourself Foremost, I think it's a really difficult time and I feel for a lot of folks that are going into such an uncertain job market in a lot of ways. Um, there are some free resources that are on places like through our Columbus Library, there's lynda.com. So you can take classes and learning how to use certain um, different type of technology things. So like video editing, all these different things or coding. There's a lot of free sort of how-to things that maybe could give you a little bit of an edge. You can add that to your resume. And you could do that maybe like an hour every day. So I don't know, there's just little little things that maybe would help give a competitive edge to and kind of keep keep you searching. Oh, and the last thing, sorry. I was like thinking about all these things as everybody else was talking. One thing that really helped me in thinking about what I actually wanted to do and give yourself time to think about that a little bit more is informational interviewing people I really admired and respected and was like, that job seems cool, but what are they doing? So if you have a chance your senior year, junior year, there's actually, it's never too early to start set up some of these informational interviews, which is just you going to that person and saying, hey, can we sit down for an hour and can I ask you questions about your job, about your life? Um, how did you get there? What is it like? And then you can kind of have a sense if that might be something you're interested in and then maybe go through, do an internship, work there or, you know, so that's another piece of advice I'd give. Great advice, great advice. And for those students who are joining us who will be joining us in the future, please feel free to connect with me at LSS and we'd be happy to make those connections. So in line with this discussion of networking and professional references and connecting this to what we discussed earlier, who is your Latinx role model?
<clears throat> I'm gonna take that one before somebody else stole her for me. That's the only reason I raised my hand. Uh, for me, is Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, I don't think that I could even imagine right now anybody who's a better role model. Uh, I mean, if you have not read her, uh, it's not a, a memoir, just kind of a between a memoir and biography. Uh, you, you have to learn about her uh, uh, humble upbringing and everything that she did uh, to be where she is today and how she took just, uh, I mean, in strides, uh, the challenges that she faced as a young uh, girl from the beginning. And, and I know that it, it's a unique story, so not, hey, you know, not everybody gets to the U.S. Supreme Court, so, but, but it's something to look up to. Uh, somebody that it, it, it just started with very humble origins and, and you can actually relate uh, to in many, many, many levels. So for me, I mean, just a, a personal hero. I think I have to say my parents. I mean, my, my, my dad was born into communism and my mom came to this country not knowing any English and, and seeing the life that they've been able to provide and the, the values they've been able to instill. And I mean, I wouldn't be anywhere if it weren't for them. I, I mean, I nearly dropped out of the university when I was a freshman. And so I, I look back on that time and the support that they gave me so I wouldn't become a statistic. They helped me realize the hot fire that I had inside of myself. So leaning on our family, I mean, it's never, it can never be understated the power that holds. And for me personally, I could not, I mean, the entirety of my family, but especially my parents. My sister just texted me Edward James almost, <laughs> but that's not, so I just saw that flash on my screen, who's very cool, um, but I'll probably just have to say my mom as well, because uh, it, it's, I think that it's really amazing the ways that she's navigated her own identity as, as somebody who's Mexican, and she has had a lot of different jobs, you know, since I was little. But currently she works for Chico State um, in administration, which is like the kind of state school in Chico, California. And she's really involved with um, DACA students and very much an activist there on campus. And it's just a good reminder that, you know, she, she took time off from all of these things that she did and she raised us and she did it in a way that was very like, obviously like celebrating her culture and caring for us. But now she's kind of back out and sort of having fighting for this cause, which I think is really neat and a reminder that we can do that at any point in our lives. Um, so she's the person I pick, I guess. <laughs> I just wanna shout out my mom, brother and sister. Hey y'all. And then our second to last question tonight, what is the one thing you wish staff joining us tonight knew about you? Can you play some more guitar for <laughs> me? Um, what am I? I really have really gotten into these um like scary podcasts lately. So there's this podcast series called Spooked, which is really good. So I'm like really, I guess that's something I think that is unique about me. I didn't really think I would be really into ghost stories and stuff, but I've been very into them lately. So if anybody ever has a good ghost story, please, please let me know and share. Mine is a boring answer, but uh, whenever I have the time, I do websites for fun. This is one way of actually just getting my mind out of the routine. Um, I did develop a website for student development called mylearningnetwork.com. That is a tool that I use to, uh, as part of my job to, to help students develop uh, academic skills to be uh, successful. Uh, the website for the organization that I mentioned before, LULAC. Uh, I also do a couple of those just, again, uh, sometimes when I find the time. So if you see that the websites are a little bit outdated, blame me because this has been a difficult time to actually get them updated. That's a, I mean, that's a tough question. I think for me, it's, I really enjoy conversations like this and engaging. Um, other people in the community, but it's, it's draining. I, this is not my preferred I'm much more of an introvert than an extrovert. And so it's, I really care a lot about it. 
to the point where, you know, I, I do want to put myself out there and continue to put myself in these conversations because it's important to move it forward that way. So yeah, it's, it's that idea of fatigue is, is very real, um, especially now, but when you care about something a lot, I mean, sometimes it takes that little extra oomph and gets you out of bed in the morning and keeps you pushing on through the day. So happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're happy to have each of you here tonight. We really are. Um, and on that mylearningnetwork.com website, Ferdinand, I saw on the bottom there a quote from Justice Sonia Sotomayor. A surplus of effort could overcome a deficit of confidence. Some wise words from our justice. And then our last are question. Are you surprised that I added that quote? <laughs> And then our last question for tonight, rounding this off. What are you doing November 3rd? Personally, I already voted, so I'm not gonna be voting. I'm done with voting, so I'm done. So anybody who could actually vote early, just go ahead and uh, do it. For me, uh, I also teach part-time. So actually that night, I'm gonna be teaching a Spanish uh, conversational class that I teach at a local uh, college called Moskingum University. So I teach a class at Ohio State and also teach that class as Spanish just to uh, help students develop uh, uh, language skills. Uh, so I'm going to be teaching that class at nine and then just rush home to wait for the results or at least whatever we can gather at that time. But just try to stay peaceful, right? Just simply stay calm. It's not an easy time to be calm. I signed up to be a poll worker, so I still need to get my early vote in. Um, so I will be out in Grandview greeting people and trying not to, you know, and ex being excited to take their addresses and first names as I make sure that they're ready to vote. So that's what I'll be doing on the third. Yeah, I, I also voted early, but I'm planning that day on sharing out as many resources, anyone that needs to get to the polls, taking it to the polls and doing as much as I can. And to Ferdinand's point, I mean, 2016 was such a, a stressful evening. Not that this won't be, but, you know, taking a zen and taking a breath and knowing that we probably won't know for a, at least a little bit. So being patient. Amazing, amazing, amazing presentation tonight from the contextualization of identity and the sense of belonging and community at Ohio State to this lack of representation on campus. Latinx role models, Ole, Ochla, Lulac, find your people, find your group, Que Pasa, developing staff and promotions, pumpkin flower empanadas and Justice Sotomayor, we had an amazing discussion tonight. And in closing, I wanna thank our panelists, Letizia Wiggins, Daniel Rodriguez, Ferdinand Avila Medina, our current attendees and our future viewers for joining us for the Ohio State University Latinx Experience webinar series. Tomorrow, we will be hosting faculty members to continue this discussion. More information about our final webinar can be found at odi.osu.edu. Should you have any future questions, comments, or concerns, please do not hesitate to con contact me directly at bustamante.40. Once again, thank you for joining us tonight. Have a good night.